Hi, I, I'm talking. No clapping. <laughs> Thank goodness you were distracted by sitting down, not to applaud me again. It's, it's, it's very tedious. <laughs> okay, that was half-hearted, though. Good. All right. <laughs> the Gospel Center Church and Mission. Again, again, what a huge topic. But let me <clears throat> let me give you my understanding of the of the uh, mission of the church in a nutshell, and then we'll drill down on one aspect of it. Uh, I believe that the mission of the church, qua church, the institutional church, the church gathered uh, together for worship, uh, you know, what we call the local church, I believe that the mission of the local church is to make disciples who will then change the world. Notice I didn't say that the job of the church is to change the world. Now, if you use the word church, it, it, meaning the local church, the gathered church, the scattered church, all the Christians in the world, yeah, that's true. But see, when Jesus says to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples, I think that's the great commission given to the apostles, actually, uh, who uh, bore the king's keys of the kingdom. Uh, the, the, the job of the local church is to preach the word to win people to Christ and to build them up and to make them into disciples who then go out into the world and they don't only evangelize. According to the Bible, the Christians in the world are also supposed to do, also supposed to do justice and love their neighbor. And so they will change the world. When I say it's not the job of a local church to change the world, I mean we don't become one more lobbying group. Rather, it's our job to bring the gospel in to bear uh, on people's lives who become disciples who then go out into the world and they do change the world because they evangelize, they integrate their faith with their work, they do justice and care for the poor, they change social structures, they love their neighbor, and they change the world. So the job of the church, qua church, is basically to minister the word to make disciples who change the world then. Now that's the nutshell. What I'd like to look at is this idea of caring for the poor and doing justice and seeing this as a very important thing that we should be equipping our disciples to do in the world because it should be a, an extraordinarily important thing for Christians to be doing. And we don't talk about it as much as we should. More maybe recently, maybe not always in the most theologically balanced way, but let me read you a passage out of Deuteronomy and uh, basically expound it to you for the, uh, our last session together. This is Deuteronomy 15. Uh, we'll, I'll give you a little background in a minute to help you understand a little bit about the economic and cultural background, but here it is. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel the loan he has made to his fellow Israelite. He shall not require payment from his fellow Israelite or brother because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt your brother owes you. However, there should be no poor among you. For in the land your God, <clears throat> the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he promised. He will lend, and you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the seventh year for canceling debts is near, so that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be, you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land, therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. And if a fellow Hebrew, a man or woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember 
You were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. Now let me show you a threefold call that God gives here to his people. A threefold call to do justice. And then the dynamic behind it, where we get the power to do it. A threefold call and the dynamic behind it. Now, before I even do the threefold call, here we have to do, is I have to waggle on the T a little bit. A little bit in the way of introduction. One thing you need to know is what, what the meaning of the loan. You notice it says that if somebody becomes poor, you must lend to them. And if you lend to them, you must cancel the debt every six years. If a foreigner is, if you lend to a foreigner, you don't have to cancel the debt, but if it's a fellow Israelite, you do. What in the world is all that about? And here's what you have to consider. Uh, number one, this was a different age in which you didn't have mortgages. You, didn't, you generally didn't have business loans. People were farmers. Virtually everybody was in agriculture. And in that situation, why would you ever need a loan? Here's why. Ordinarily, a farmer plants the, the crop, harvests the crop, sells the grain, and on the proceeds lives an entire year, usually not very well, and has enough money to buy seed for next year's crop. Got it? But if you have a very, very bad um, year, you might not have enough to live. Or you might have enough to live but not enough to buy next year's crop, in which case you need a loan. And if you have a second really bad year, a year after uh, you already have a loan, and you're hoping for a very good crop so you can pay the loan off, but now you have a very bad crop, at that point, you probably would sell yourself into slavery. Now slavery, you and I, when you and I think of slavery, we think of race-based, lifelong, chattel slavery. We're talking about something more like indentured servanthood. If you got one loan and you couldn't pay it off and you went further into debt, then you would get into uh, a situation where you were working for somebody else until you paid the debt off. They didn't have debtor's prison, they didn't have bankruptcy, that's how it was done. Now what this means is that foreigners who came in, there were not that many foreigners living in, in Israel, and the ones who came in, they were more likely, if you had a loan to a foreigner, it was more likely a business loan. But business loans, mortgages were unknown the only reason you would need a loan is because you were falling into poverty. So if you were poor, you needed a loan. And if you needed a loan, you were poor. Got it? The idea of business loans and mortgages was ba basically not there. What sounds a little bit racist to say, well, you, you know, you have to, you have to forgive your, your fellow Israelite, but you don't have to forgive the foreigner, probably means that the fellow Israelite was a, poor, a person who was falling into poverty. It was your job to give them a loan to keep them from poverty, the foreigner, was in a different situation. It usually was a business loan and wasn't, uh, you might say, regulated by the laws of social justice as you see here in Deuteronomy 15. You put all that together, got that? That's the background. It, it's basically saying whenever you see a fellow Israelite, a neighbor or a relative, falling into poverty, you must loan to them and you must forgive every six years the loan or if they're actually in double jeopardy, which is to say they not only couldn't pay the loan back, but now they're working for you as, a, as an indentured servant. Every six years or every seven years, we, know, we don't know if it was the beginning of the sixth, seventh year or the end of the seventh year, we don't know. But every six years, you have to forgive the loan whether you've gotten all of the money back or not. Now here's, now that you know the situation, there's a threefold call that God is giving in these verses. A threefold call to his people to do justice. What is it? The first call is to astonishing generosity. Do you know how astonishingly generous this is? Don't forget the tithe is already a rule. This is on top of the tithe. You're already giving 10% of your income away. The tithe. On top of that, if you have ever have a needy um, uh, relative or you have a needy neighbor who starts to fall into poverty in some way, you must loan to them and you mustn't, interestingly enough, you mustn't have this wicked thought. Hmm, the seventh year is only two years away. If I give a loan, I'm only going to get about 30 or 40% of my loan back. I'm not going to do it. You notice 
You notice what it says? It says, be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the seventh year for canceling debts is near. So what? So you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. He may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. It does not say you're just stingy. I, I, I want to come to this one. We're Americans and we're individualistic in our culture. And the idea of not being generous, being a sin, being wicked, we don't like that. You say, look, as Bill Cosby said, because it's my money. Don't you remember those commercials? <laughs> There's a lot of commercials that really say, you earned it, it's your money, you can do what you want with it, and if, somebody, if you want to be generous with it, sure, you can be generous with it, but nobody has the right to tell you what to do with your money. Oh yeah, God does. Oh yeah, God does. And what God says is, if you have a neighbor or a relative that's falling into poverty, and even though you're already tied, you don't help them, that's wicked. And you don't loan, even though you know you're probably not going to get all your money back, and you don't give it to them, that's wicked. This is astonishing generosity, you know that. We're talking about very high levels. This is beyond the tithe. And yet you're being told that if you don't do it, you're wicked. So it's pretty remarkable. So the first thing is, we see this astonishing level of generosity. It's just uh, something we, something we, we Americans, are very, we, we really pat ourselves on the back if we tithe. And here we have a situation where you say the tithe is the minimum. The tithe, giving to the Lord, giving to the poor, giving away 10%, that's the minimum. Beyond that, if you see opportunities, people who uh, you really need to be helping, if you don't help them, you are wicked. I don't know. This is beyond what we're used to, but there it is. So first, it's a call to astonishing generosity. And a lack of generosity is wickedness. It's not just stinginess. The second thing you're called to is to empower the poor, not just give them charity. Did you hear this part? Well, first of all, he says, be open-handed. That's in verse 7 and 8. Be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> not just, well, I'll give you this. Give him what he needs. But it's down here in verse 14, 13, 14. It says, if a fellow Hebrew, a man or woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. And when you release him, do not send him away empty-handed, Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Why? It's not enough just to give relief to the poor. You also want to empower the poor, uh, invest in the person, uh, whatever it takes in order to get them on a self-sufficient, into a self-sufficient life. Now, in those days, what it meant was it wasn't enough just to send the person that way. Okay, you've paid the debt. This is pretty interesting. It says, supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor. Why? So they can, they can get a farm going again. So you're giving them startup capital. I mean, it's, <laughs> again, it's not just generosity in this case. You have a vision. You're not just there to do the minimum. You're not just there to say, look, I help these poor people, a little bit of charity. You have a vision to develop people, to help them grow up and become sufficient so that they're not falling into poverty all the time. It's, it's one thing, for example, and by the way, relief is very important. Soup kitchens are very important. Thrift stores are very important. Uh, hungry people need to be fed. Naked people need to be clothed. See? Thirsty people need to be given drink, of course. But they also need, they need jobs. And if they can't read or write, they need to be taught. And if they need uh, a job training in order to get a decent job, then they need to be given job training. That is way more expensive way more difficult. In many cases they have addiction problems and they need to be helped with that. It's not enough just to give the poor charity. They need to be empowered. Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor. That's capital and that's giving capital and that's way more expensive and way more difficult. And uh, it's not just expensive financially, it's expensive emotionally, it's expensive personally. Uh, so basically, you're called beyond just mere relief, even though relief is very important, and those of you who are involved with relief ministries, it's really important. You can't, you can't make a person self-sufficient if they're dead. And a lot of people will die without basic relief ministry. But there's relief for the poor, you know, shelter for the homeless, soup kitchen, and so on. But there's also job training. There's also bringing, bringing the poor to economic, social, moral, personal, and spiritual self-sufficiency. So that's the second call. Astonishing generosity, 
uh, empowerment for the poor. And now here's the third thing, and I don't know, I think it'd be hard to, it'd be easy to miss. You are called to hope for the poor. You're called away from cynicism. I'm afraid an awful lot of Christians, certainly in America, are very, very cynical about the poor. They know, yes, what the Bible says, we need to do something about it. And you actually feel kind of bitter about yourself. I mean, I, I'm really glad that for all of his work, but I just remember how often I used to, when Jerry Lewis used to do those uh, telethons, you know, how often he used to say, and I heard him say several times, say, send in $100 and you can look in the mirror and you can say, you are a good person. Okay, well, I need that $100, so I'll, I'll do whatever I can to get it from you. But uh, to, to, it, that is pretty, uh, pretty crass. Uh, in other words, you can feel better about yourself because you're helping the poor. That's incredibly selfish, of course. But because of that, we have a tendency to say, all right, yeah, there they are, and I feel good about myself a little bit for taking part, but things are always going to be the same. Listen carefully to this remarkable, remarkable balance. It says, there should be no poor among you if you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all the commands I'm giving you this day. That's verse 4. Then verse 11, you may have heard this, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your brothers and toward the poor and needy in your land. Now, that sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? On the one hand, it says, if you fully obey my laws, if you lend to the poor when they need it, if you, if you supply them from the, your threshing floor, if you forgive their debts, if you, in other words, if you are as generous and involved in the life of the poor as I say, God says, if you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow your commands, there will be no poor among you. But then in verse 11 it says there will always be poor among you. Now, it's not a contradiction. We have to assume that it's the same paragraph, that the man's not contradicting himself. And so you can resolve it pretty easily, but I think there's more to it than just this. You can just say what really is being said, there will be no permanent class of poor in the land. People will become poor, but they won't stay permanently poor. They'll become poor all the time. You have bad crops, you have, I mean, you have famines, you, all sorts of things will happen. Uh, there is laziness that can get people into poverty. There are bad, uh, uh, you know, risky business uh, deals that get you into poverty. There's, there's, a, there's a famine that gets you into poverty. There's illness, there's a, a crime. All sorts of things can get you into poverty. So people fall into poverty, but he's saying if you had a society in which everybody was as generous as God commands you to be, you wouldn't have a permanent culture of poverty. You wouldn't have a permanent class of poor people. Now, I'll tell you what that is. That is a remarkable balance in attitude. It's not utopian, and it's not cynicism. Utopianism is if we just do this and this and this, that's the end of poverty. And, Paul, and God here says the poor will always be produced. On the other hand, the cynicism shouldn't be there either. There needs to be hope for the poor. And by the way, I must tell you, I don't see this, uh, just as a sidebar, I don't know, when I read Deuteronomy 15 over and over, over again, I, I do read it a lot, I have, and it doesn't seem to fit into the existing approaches to public policy. On the one hand, this is by no means socialism, by no means. There's no indication that private property is being compromised or that, that all property is being held in common. Uh, private property is still very personal. On the other hand, it's not normal capitalism. You know why? The claims of capital are, are far are relativized compared to the way they are today. What is the claim of capital? If I've made an investment, then I can move you into bankruptcy if you don't pay me, or I can uh, put you in, in sometimes in the past debtor's prison if you don't pay me, or I can put you into slavery and you have to work it off if you don't pay me. Those are the claims of capital. But what Deuteronomy shows, shows that every six years the claims of capital go away, no matter how big the debts are. There's, there's no permanent long-term indebtedness in Israel. Because God wants the people of God to be that generous with each other. That's not exactly, certainly it's not socialism, but it's not normal capitalism either. Uh, it's something else. And if you say, well, that's Deuteronomy, that's Old Testament. We're New Testament. 
In Acts chapter 4, verses 34 to 35, Paul says that, oh, this, this is what Acts 4 says. This is, of course, Luke writing about the early church. And Luke says, quote, there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Very familiar, right? Uh, the early church was, in the early church, there was such radical sharing, not communism, but such radical sharing of private property uh, that when any, some, anybody started falling into poverty, people were quite willing to liquidate assets and bring them to the apostles and distribute it to the people in need. The, did, you, did you hear it clear? It started this way. There were no needy persons among them. And you know what's interesting? That term, no needy persons, is a quote. It's a quote directly from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it's right out of Deuteronomy 15.4, where, where God says, if you obey everything, if you fully follow everything I say, there will be no needy among you. Paul was going right into Deuteronomy 15, and he wasn't saying, oh, that's the Old Testament. He pulls that out, you see, and Luke pulls that out because Luke was, you know, and Paul were uh, together on this because Paul does the same thing. Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 pulls stuff out of Exodus where it talks about the manna, how everybody had to uh, share the manna and nobody could have too much or too little. Uh, Paul and Luke were very, very happy to go right back to the Old Testament and say all that stuff about generosity, all that stuff about caring for the poor, brothers and sisters, all that stuff inside the church at the very least there needs to be radical sharing. And you realize what, what high percentage of the poor people in this country are Christians inside churches? Start right there. Start right there. Why aren't the wealthy churches sharing with the poor churches, for example? You know, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, well, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says that, that the church is supposed to, uh, you know, care for the, the poor of the whole country. I've had a number of people say, that's the social gospel. That's the social gospel. We're not supposed to care for the poor. Well, that's a that's a, you know, that's a, that's a debate that I can have, but I'm not going to have it with you right here. But here's what I can say. It says here there should be no needy Christians. What about all the poor churches? Look, at, look in Boston. Look at New York City. Look at all the storefront churches filled with really great people, really sweet people, in many cases really godly people, and they are poor. What's the matter with those of us who are, have got more? Hmm? What's our excuse? There needs to be, here's the threefold call. Radical generosity, empowerment, and hope. And what's the dynamic? Where are we going to get this? Listen, guilt doesn't really work on this. It, uh, if, you, if you try to, I mean, and maybe up to now that's all I've been doing. So you, you know, you're middle class or you know, you're professional people. You need to be sharing with the poor. Why? You have more and they have less. Guilt works for an hour or two. Yeah, you know, you, 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 they can walk out of, the, out, of, out of the church hearing a sermon like that and feeling guilty and it just isn't going to last. Here's what's going to last. Let me read it to you. It's at the very end of the passage. Uh, Supply him liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Verse 15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. Boy, there it is, the Old Testament. The Old Testament, and yet, he says, I'm commanding you to do this, but the motivation you should have for it is the grace of God. I think Dr. Ed Clowney used to say, God requires the love that cannot be required. And what he meant is, God requires you to show love to people which is not a response to the, a requirement but something that just comes up. Why? You were slaves in Egypt. So the reason you need, to be care you need to be good for the poor is that you were poor and I brought you out. I saved you. Well, you say, how does that, how does that, <laughs> how does that apply to us? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that through his poverty you might become rich. Now, let's put it this way. 
the dynamic of grace, the dynamic of gospel grace, of free, sovereign grace, will change your attitudes if you're not poor toward the poor, and it will change their attitudes toward themselves. And so it will completely transform. Grace transforms social structures. Grace brings about justice. It sounds weird. I'm saved by grace. Sheer grace. I'm not getting what I deserve at all. Uh, gospel is that Jesus died for my sins, and because he was punished in my place, now I get this free grace. It sounds weird that that would mean that that would make me do justice. That would be the dynamic behind doing justice. The fact that I didn't get justice, and got, Jesus got the justice, you know, Jesus got the just punishment that I deserve, and because I didn't, that's going to make me just? Yes, like this. First of all, I said grace changes your attitude toward the poor. It says in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. And you know what that means. Blessed are the bankrupt in spirit. It's the same thing. Uh, most commentators, if they look at that, poor in spirit, they say something like this. To be poor in spirit means to say, I am spiritually bankrupt and I need sheer grace. You can't become a Christian unless you're willing to say that. So, for example, if you go to God and say, Lord, I've lived a pretty good life and I deserve a lot, but probably not heaven, so would you help me in this way and that way? So I've got some good things I can offer, but uh, I haven't quite made it, so could you help me in these ways? No, no, no. See, you're not... That's not being poor in spirit, that's being middle class in spirit. <laughs> See, a middle class in spirit is, well, I'm not perfect, but I've really worked pretty hard. So you're going to God and you're saying, look, I, knew, I know I need some grace, but you know, I've also, you know, I've been a good mother, I've been a good father, I've tried very hard, I've worked pretty hard, you know, I didn't sleep around, I mean, I've actually kept my nose clean. And so you, you kind of feel like God owes things, but not everything. He owes you some things, but not everything. That's being middle class in spirit. It's not being poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is, Lord, I am absolutely bankrupt. I have, I have all my bad deeds, but even my good deeds were done for bad motives. And therefore, I need complete grace. Even the good things I've done, I did them because I did them to feel good about myself. I did them in order to get things from people. I did them in order to, feel, uh, to get you to do things. So every single thing I've got, my righteousness is as a filthy rag. I've never done anything truly holy in my life. See, now you're spiritually bankrupt. And you say, Lord, I need complete salvation, sheer salvation. I am spiritually bankrupt. Please fill me with the riches of Jesus Christ's grace. Save me just for Jesus' sake. I have nothing to offer. I have nothing with which I can make good my debts. That's being spiritually bankrupt. And you're not a Christian until you get there. Otherwise, you're just a Pharisee. You're just a person who's basically... Yeah, basically saving yourself for your good works. But when you become a real Christian because you know you're saved by grace, do you realize what that means? When you look at a poor person on the street, you know you're looking spiritually in a mirror. This is how God sees you. The person's going around in a filthy rag. The person smells terrible. The person's a failure. That's exactly what God saw in you. And yet Jesus Christ became poor so that you, through his poverty, could become rich. You were spiritually poor. You were just like that. You cannot look down your nose at the poor at all. The gospel grace just gets rid of all that condescension. It gets rid of all that pride. It just tears that out. You know, I remember uh, one, uh, Kathy and I had a, a friend in Hope. Well, he's, he's gone now, passed away, but he was one of our first elders. And um, he's a white man in a small southern town in 1975, we, we, we got there. And I'll never forget, uh, just not too many months after uh, I got there, uh, he really got a grip on the gospel that he'd never gotten a grip on, understanding he was saved by grace, not by his works. Never really understood that. And it really changed things, because I remember one day, he, he sat down and he says, you know, Pastor, I realize this is a man in his 50s, he was a career, um, uh, he'd been in the military for years. He'd been a sergeant, quartermaster. He's a tough guy, rough guy, southern white guy, southern white, white redneck, okay? And uh, which he would say, he'd call himself that. Uh, one day he sat down and he says, you know, I've really been reading and understanding back of the gospel, and I realized something. I've been a racist my whole life. 
And I looked at him and I said, what makes you say that? Because see, being a young Yankee, I was 25 years old, come into the South, take this church. I hadn't said anything about racism yet. I was too scared. I mean, I saw racism all through the town, and it was there, and it, you know, it just a few, segregation had just gone away just a few years earlier than that, not very long. And I hadn't said anything about it, but here's a guy who was reading Galatians, and reading about the fact that he was uh, saved by grace, and it was really digging in, it was really getting rid of his pride, it was really getting rid of his self-righteousness, and he says, you know, I realize that, you know, I'm just a regular old guy, I, you know, he, he didn't finish high school, he only had an eighth grade education. He says, I began to realize that I like to look down at black people and I like to look down at poor people as a way of making myself feel better because I've always had this inferiority complex. But you know what? I don't need to do that anymore. I hadn't said a word about it. 1975, 1976, in the South, I hadn't said a word about racism. Where he came up with that, it was just the Holy Spirit made him see that the, God's grace makes us just. Not getting what justice demands from us empowers us to give other people what justice demands for them. You know, in other words, we have, to, we have to treat people with justice. We have to treat people with equity. We have to treat people fairly. It was fascinating. So he, first of all, the gospel changes your attitude toward the poor. But secondly, when the poor get a hold of the gospel, it changes their attitude toward themselves. It gives, it gives them hope. Uh, Miroslav Wolf, who teaches theology at Yale, you know, some of you have known of some of his books, was walking around an impoverished inner city neighborhood some years ago in Baltimore with another friend of mine. And the pastor there, the young pastor, said to Wolf offhandedly, you know, he said, one of the great resources for the healing of the inner city and the brokenness of the people here is the doctrine that we're justified by sheer grace. And Wolf was surprised. And he wrote an essay about it. And he says this. He starts off by saying, justification by grace alone, that's a doctrine. It's like a Protestant doctrine, okay. But it's kind of a, all right, it's maybe you believe it, maybe you don't. How in the world does that help the poor in the inner city of Baltimore? And this is what he wrote. Imagine that you have no job, no money. You live cut off from the rest of society in a world ruled by poverty and shame. Your skin is the wrong color, quote unquote, and you have no hope that any of this will ever change. Around you is a society governed by the iron law of achievement. Its gilded goods are flaunted before your eyes on TV screens, and in a thousand ways, society tells you every day you are worthless because you have no achievement. You're a failure, and you know you will continue to be a failure because there is no way to achieve tomorrow what you have not managed to achieve today. Your dignity is shattered, your soul is enveloped in the darkness of despair. But the gospel now comes. And the gospel tells you that you are not defined by outside forces. It tells you that you count even more, that you are loved unconditionally and infinitely, irrespective of anything you've ever achieved or failed to achieve. Imagine now this gospel not simply proclaimed but embodied in a community. Imagine furthermore this community determined to infuse the wider culture along with its political and economic institutions with a message that it seeks to embody and proclaim. This is justification by grace. A dead doctrine? Hardly. You see how that could change somebody? But lastly, this is the last thing. The book of Deuteronomy indicates that the nations are watching. I think it's up here in chapter four, if I remember correctly, near the very beginning of chapter four, where it says, Yes, see, I have taught you these decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you will follow them in the land you're entering. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely, what other nation is so great as to have God near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? What Moses is saying is, the nations are going to watch, and if you live according to the laws of justice, the remarkable laws of generosity and justice that we have here, the nations will say, what a God these people have. I, I'm an evangelist first. 
That's my first love. Of all the aspects of the church's mission, that's what I enjoy doing. I, uh, there's a whole lot of other things the church does, but that's the thing I like the most. But I want you to know something. Unless Christians are famous for being the most committed to the poor and needy in their community, unless Christians are famous for doing justice in their neighborhood, I don't think people are going to listen to what we have to say about Jesus and the gospel. I remember some years ago I talked to a woman, I've never forgotten this, who came to my church, and I talked to her afterwards, and I found out that she was actually very, very good friends with a, uh, the wife of a pastor of another church in town. And I said, I'm glad you're visiting our church. Um, so, uh, you know, tell me more about where you are spiritually and what's going on. And I'll never forget what she said. She says, the minister at my church is really great. He is very persuasive. He is very dynamic. He's probably the best preacher in town. <laughs> this was many years ago. But... I, was, I didn't know where the rankings were. I, admit, I, I wondered, where do you post the rankings? You know? uh, and then she said, but I know how he treats his wife. I, I know he's narcissistic. I know he's abusive and cruel, not physically, but verbally. His deeds don't match his words, so when I sit under his powerful preaching, I get nothing out of it. Uh, that scared me. I ran home, and I walked to the door. I said, honey, I smell a dirty diaper. Can I get that for you? <laughs> uh, I was scared because I realized I was being watched. But so are you. So is your church. If people just see us evangelizing, if that's all we do, they just see us building bigger buildings and putting on annexes and having work, you know, cars in the parking lot and then the city has to, the town has to have a, a you know, a, a cop out there and, and everybody gets grumpy at you and they, you know, we think we're preaching the word but the, everybody else sees us just enlarging our tribe. Just, just, it, they see it as a power grab. They're wrong, I hope. They're wrong. I hope we, we, if, we, if we see people coming to faith in Christ and the church is growing, but that's all we do and the world watches they won't see that our deeds are backing up our words. They'll say, well, you know, you're just out for yourselves. But if they see us pouring ourselves out for the community, and especially for the poor, if they see us doing that, then our words back up, our deeds back up the words, and then people will listen to the words. Never forget what she said. He's a powerful preacher because I know his deeds don't back up his words. I get nothing out of his words. And people won't get anything out of us. So there's the threefold call. There's the dynamic, and there is the incredible testimony that justice can make to grace. Grace makes us just, and then the justice is an incredible testimony to the reality of grace in our lives. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful that you've given us this powerful, powerful resource, which is the gospel. We know, Lord, that the gospel is something that if we just expose people to it, lives change. If we just expose Christians to it, we become more like Jesus. And if we embody it in the way in which we pour ourselves out, in which we, in a sense, impo impoverish ourselves as we are uh, loving and serving other people, then others will see that and will hear our words and will believe them and will have their lives changed. So we pray, Lord, that the church is represented in this room and the, uh, the people in this room might become agents for loving their neighbor and doing justice so that people will listen to the words of the gospel. Thank you for giving us this mission and thank you for all the ways in which you bless us through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.